Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for being here and thank you for your patience um, as we're getting ready to discuss impact investing and the funding of the SDGs in Nigeria. Without any further ado, I would like to call upon Maria Glover, who is the project lead at the Impact Investors Foundation of Nigeria, and she's going to give a brief overview of what we're going to be discussing, impact investing, the sustainable development goals, and how we bridge the funding gap in Nigeria. So please put your hands together for Maria Glover, who is the project lead of the Impact Investors Foundation of Nigeria. Thank you. Thank you, Lily, for that warm introduction. Is this working? Okay. Good evening, everybody. Thank you, Lily, for that introduction, and I would like to welcome all of you to this. Um, impact investing is a conversation that has really, you know, gained traction over the last decade, and the conversation has become mainstream with investors, but this was not the case some 10 years back. And if you look at our challenges that we are facing, our social and environmental challenges, they've really grown over this past 10 years. If you look at the inequality, the number of people living in extreme poverty have increased. Let's take a look at Nigeria. We have 95 million people living in extreme poverty. And 50% of that amount live on less than $2 a day. And if you ask, why impact investing? Impact investing is a strategy that we can use to fund the SDG. And from the slide there, you can see that the market has really grown. From 2007, when impact investing was first coined, the global impact investing network tried to measure the size of the market and in 2013 the size of the market is about 35.5 billion US dollars as at today that market is about 502 billion US dollars in total assets under management held by over 1,203 um, impact investors. And when you look at Nigeria, impact investing too has grown significantly from 2015 when the total capital deployed for impact investing was $1.9 billion. As at September last year, that amount has uh, it's become 4.7 billion US dollars. So there's a lot of conversation, the traction has grown. And if you want to ask why impact investing, I can answer that question for you quite frankly and happy to do so. And also to make a case why we need more people, more investors into the impact investing space. Okay. Impact investing is the new strategy for funding our SDGs. And you know the SDG was created by United Nations to ensure that no one gets left behind and also to solve our social and, develop, social and environmental problem and nagging problems, I would say. The UN um, conference, tra um, UN UNTAC it's called, they actually said we will require about four to seven trillion dollars in capital expenditure every year in order to achieve our SDGs by 2030. That's a whooping amount of money. Now, the traditional way we solve our development problem is through development finance assistance from sources like the public um, funds from the government. We have home offices and foundations and development finance. Put all of them together, it's not enough to, form our S to fund our SDGs. So, if we actually need to fund this SDG, we now have to start looking at the private sector. We need to channel funds from the private sector to fund in the SDG. The gap, as UN says, is about 2.5 trillion. But from the analysis here, we actually need about 3.8 to 7.8 trillion. That's the gap to fund the SDG, and we can't do it. The private sector has all the funds. In a research done by PwC, the total asset under management held by 
assets and wealth holders globally is about 11, $111.2 trillion. Ladies and gentlemen, less than 10% of that will adequately fund our SDGs. But why is that not happening? When we bring this closer home, the United Nations says that we'll need $337 billion in three years, from 2019 to 2021, to fund our own SDGs. Where is that going to come from? That's about $100 trillion for the three years. Then for one year alone, let me put this in context, our total budget from the federal government for this year, the approved budget, is 10.59 trillion naira, which estimates about to 35 billion US dollars. There clearly is a funding gap, and we need to get funds from the private sector to do that. So impact investing is that strategic way we can do that, which marries two kinds of funds from one extreme, where the fund is focused on investing for social impact, and another extreme where the fund is purely commercial for profit purposes. At Impact Investors Foundation, our focus is to channel funds from the private sector into impact investing, to unlock those funds for social and environmental problems. Otherwise, you and I will keep living and having the same challenges that we face year in, year out. So what we want to do is build this ecosystem have funds unlocked from private sectors to solve our problems in a very strategic way. And how we do that is to engage with key um, um, people within the sectors. And we have three focused areas, and all of these areas we are backed by research so that the interventions that we are carrying out actually solves real life problems. I'll just mention a few of them. We, our flagship program is the annual convening of impact investing. I've seen a few faces who were at the last convening we had. And that convening is a platform that connects actors within, the, within and outside the impact investing space, like government, foundations, um, investors, impact enterprises, all to look at the opportunities and challenges of expanding the impact investing market. Um, I'd like to use the opportunity to invite each and every one of you here for our third annual convening on impact investing. We have over three to 400 people that come up in such events. So it's a great market and great networking platform for you. And also, we had our first deal summit. The deal summit is a platform that connects social enterprises to investors who are willing to invest in their businesses. And last year was our first deal summit where we had 15 social enterprises who pitched their businesses to 19 impact investors. And the feedback we got were remarkable. 75% of them are currently either being signed up, have signed up a deal or are in the pipeline of doing that. And we have like 85% of them said they had great feedbacks that has helped them in their businesses. In summary, there is a gap that we need to bridge as regards to the SDGs. The government alone cannot do it. We need people from the private sector to come into that space. And impact investing is that strategy we can use to bridge the SDG gap. And Impact Investors Foundation is an organization established to do that. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to invite you to join the Impact Investors Foundation to build a strong ecosystem that supports impact investing. Thank you, and enjoy the rest of your day. Please put your hands together for Maria Glover, the project lead of the Impact Investors Foundation. Thank you so much for your patience. Uh, without any further ado, I'd like to please call up our panelists so we can get into the conversation. Uh, the first person I'm going to call is Mariam Uwais, who is the SSA to the President, uh, His Excellency Muhammadu Buhari, on social investments. Please put your hands together for her as she comes up onto the stage. I think we can do better than that, please, guys. Thank you. Um, Sam, Sam Nwanze, who's the Chief Investment Officer at Ayers Holdings, please put your hands together for him. <laughs> Professor Yinka David West, 
academic director at the Lagos Business School. Please keep clapping for her. Dr. Abasi Ene Obong, who is the CEO of 54 Gene. Put your hands together for him. And last but not least, Adesua Ihile, who is representing Innocent Chukuma, uh, the West Africa director for Ford Foundation. Let's put our hands together for her as she comes onto the stage. So to all our panelists um, and to our audience members, thank you for being with us and thank you for traveling from you know, far and near to be with us as we discuss this very important conversation on impact investing and the funding of SDGs in Nigeria. So as Maria gave a little bit of a presentation about impact investing, I'd like to give a little bit of background as to why we're here. Um, so as you know, development finance has gone through fundamental changes over the past decades, with private capital increasingly taking center stage. Consequently, the demand for impact financing has shown tremendous growth in recent years. So essentially, if you turn to your brochure, you'll see the list of SDGs, the 17 SDGs, so you can refer to them um, as you please. So essentially, we know that SDGs make business sense. But the question that we're here to answer today is how do we combine social goods with profits? So my first question is for Dr. Yinka David West. Um, as an academic, you know that impact investing is an investment method that is picking up momentum in various parts of the world. Um, impact investments are investments made with the intention to generate positive measurable social, environmental, and climate impact alongside a financial res uh, return. Given your academic research, what does this look like in real life? Can you give us some examples of some impact-related uh, businesses in Nigeria so that people can have a context as to the kind of businesses that we're talking about when we talk about impact investing? Okay, thanks, Lele, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Well, I think that uh, my research area is not specifically impact investing, so I'm right. just going to take an opt-out of that one. Sam might be able to give you more examples, but let's generally look at it. I think the whole idea is typically when we're making investments in business, we're looking at economic value alone. And I think what we're trying to do with impact investment is let's broaden the scope and take it away from this um, corporate social responsibility and not-for-profit mentality. And sometimes we believe that not-for-profit is really like a charity rather than, it doesn't mean not-for-surplus in that sense. But then again, when you look at the way developing countries are, we have a lot of social and economic and developmental challenges that um, Maria spoke to. How do we address those challenges and how do we close those gaps? We need interventions. Interventions cost money. And those interventions must be sustainable in a manner such that they can continue on their own and become their own life source. So when we talk about impact investing, I think one impact investing investment that it comes to mind is M-Pesa. So a lot of us think about M-Pesa and Safaricom as the mobile money tool that broke the back of financial inclusion. But then again, the initial seed money came from DFID. And that's an impact investment because it wasn't just about build a platform, it was about empower people financially. So when you think about impact investment, it's really about what is, the, what is the theory of change and what is the secondary impact and outcome on people's lives and real people, not just that we're going to do ABC and make a lot of money out of it. So in somewhere like Kenya now, not only has it empowered individuals, it's created a, a whole new job class called agents. And these agents are also employing and providing financial services and feeding their families. So when we look at impact investment generally, there are two ways to do it. You can do it directly or you can do it through an, an impact accelerator program, for example. In Nigeria, CC Hub, one of the um, technology hubs, actually does some impact um, accelerator programs. And that, it's out of one of those that the company called Budget came out of. So when you think about, okay, why did they do this? They did a weekend acceleration program for civic tech because they, one of the challenges we realize is that people don't have enough information and knowledge on governance and civic duties and responsibilities. And that's how budget came about in general. So monies went into that and monies are still going into budget. So it's about how do we empower citizens to make governments more accountable? 
Another impact investment is a company called Pagatech, which we know does um, financial services and financial transactions. Mm -hmm. And the list go goes on and on. All but right. then again, you find out that direct impact investment into businesses is the other area. All right. Thank, Thank you, you so much for that. Um, so speaking of government, my next question is for Mrs. Mariam Uwais. Um, so currently, there is an 118 trillion, um, there's 118 trillion dollars in the global markets. Um, evidence shows that in developing nations such as Nigeria, the government does not always have the full capacity and cannot be held solely responsible for solving socio-economic issues. The growing impact investment market provides capital to address the world's most pressing challenges in sectors such as sustainable agriculture, renewable energy, and so on and so forth. Um, how is the government providing an enabling environment for impact investing in Nigeria? So thank you, Leila, and good afternoon, um, everyone. The government has been providing money, but it's budgeted from the, the impact investing um, arena is rather new. And we have been trying to engage the private sector to actually invest in programs that are driven by the challenge, of course, is that government, if you want scale and you want, um, you want convening power, government has to have um, some role to play. Um, we started four programs in the past, 2015, and I remember going around trying to get the private, private sector interested. But just like many of the politicians, the private sector wants to see returns on investment, immediate returns on investment. And the, the area, the social sector takes time. It's not a tangible return in the sense that it's, uh, it takes three to five years for you to begin to see the results. And I remember when I engaged the NESG, one of the things they said to me was, you need to develop the economic value chain to make it visible for the private sector to be able to invest because they're not going to take risks with the kind of leaks and the wastages that we see in the public sector. I think it's very important for there to be um, a very close partnership between the public sector and the private sector, but the challenge is how to encourage the private sector, and I'm really delighted that this conversation has started, because the government cannot do it alone, definitely, and even with the public sector, the politicians tend to prioritize the brick and the mortar. They want to see the roads and the airports and the bridges. That's where they can say their legacies are. That's where they say, um, well, that, that's where the contracts are, to be very blunt. But, but at the end of the day, I mean, education and health, all those issues are, are they don't, they, they're secondary. And there has to be a way of driving, getting all the various states who all are autonomous units, they have, the state, they have their own budgets, to focus on what needs to be done for our human capital and the SDGs. So getting especially technology into this space for scale, for objectivity, because part of the problem for us, of course, is subjectivity. A lot of the government officials and the politicians and the influencers want to say, how do I benefit from this? You know, so it's critical that we engage the private sector so that we're able to reach the people that actually deserve the kind of support and the, um, the, the benefits of impact investing. So I don't know if I've answered your question. You definitely have tried. Thank you for <laughs> <Yeah>. that. <laughs> um, so I just, well, before I go on to um, the panelists, the other panelists on the in this session, who is responsible for driving impact investing in Nigeria? Um, I know that you are very involved in setting up the Impact Investors Foundation, and the Ford Foundation actually has the largest endowments of any foundation in the world um, of $1 billion dedicated to mission-related investments. Um, so can you speak to us about who is responsible for driving um, impact investing in Nigeria? Um. I'd like to approach this question in a different sense. 
So instead of thinking about who is responsible for driving impact investing, I'll say who is concerned about filling this funding gap that was mentioned earlier. If you remember um, from the keynote speech, 3.8 million is needed to fund the SDGs and development assistant is currently decreasing. However, we have 11 trillion in private capital. So just considering all of this, you can see it has to be a concerted effort of everyone. It's not just the government who is tasked with this responsibility of driving more socially driven businesses. The private sector also needs to be involved. Us donor agencies also need to be involved. And um, what was discussed earlier about the private sector reluctance to get into the space is a lot of times the private sector is not too... Um, is, not, is more hesitant to get into the social sector because of all the risks that are involved. Right. And that's where the other players come in. We help to de-risk the space so that we can invite more private capital and also to make impact investing look like it's a way of doing business, not something that's trendy, not something that's a corporate social responsibility, but something that's a way of doing business. Thank you for that. So speaking of the private sector, uh, Sam Onwanze, we're going to come to you. Um, Sam is the Chief Investment Officer at Ayers Holdings. So I think we've established that the private sector is key um, in bridging these SDG gaps. Um, Tony Lumelu famously said that there is a better way to invest in Africa for a sustainable future that creates value for all. Can you, can you talk to the kind of impact investments that are the most viable in Nigeria? And can you also talk to the work that you're doing in terms of impact investing at your firm. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Lily, and thanks for, for inviting me here. Okay. Um, as I was coming in, I, I sent a message to my teenage daughters to say that um, I'll be speaking at a social media, social media week, and mm -hmm. they were laughing because they never believed that I could have anything to do with social media. And <laughs> so thanks for, for, for scoring some points. So the, the, first of all, let me just establish one uh, thing. So we in, uh, in Hess Holdings and the Tony Edmelu Foundation group, that whole group, we've been involved in this whole impact investing uh, journey for, for 10 years now. Um, as far back as 2010, when we set up the foundation, impact investing formed a major part of you know, the four elements that we focused on, on how we're going to deploy philanthropic capital. And Apart from even putting money in impact investing, we've also been involved in advocacy. You know, we're very actively involved in, in the gene, in the setup of the Global Impact Investing Network, and I sat on the board for about three years. And we've also been involved even in the academic space to try and create, you know, enlightenment because of the power we see in uh, uh, the concept of uh, impact investing. And so we've done a number of things academic. In fact, I used to teach impact investing at the Oxford Business School for three years as well. Okay. So we've been very active in this space you know, beyond saying it, even in the way we've deployed capital. But over the years, what we've noticed and what we've seen is that, you know, there's a problem with the way impact investing is being viewed. In today's society, and I'm speaking candidly, is we kind of see impact investing as an asset class. And then what we see is that, you know, if you have your portfolio of investments, you should have a portfolio that is focused on impact investing separate from the other investments that you have. And the problem with that is, it will be very difficult, I come from the commercial side, to get commercial capital to pay significant attention to the whole idea if we continue to see it as a separate asset class. What we need to do and what we've tried to do is to take the principles of impact investing and make it the principles of investing full stop. So if you're going to do investments, your investment should not only take into account commercial return, but you consider developmental and social impact. And this is exactly what we do at Hairs Holdings. As an investment company, in fact, if you come to go to our website or anything for the last 10 years, we are an African investment company that makes uh, investments in key sectors across the continent that, that generate both commercial return and developmental impact. Could you and speak to some of those um, investments that you guys have yeah. made? So I, I was going to come to that. So if you look at what we've done on the foundation side, like I said, we started by having a portfolio. We did a number of impact investing in Nigeria and across the continent. But we began to see that it was more important to create entrepreneurs because if we focus on developing a, a, a sea of entrepreneurs on the continent, these guys will solve the problems 
that we have identified in the SDG and be able to deliver the solutions and get us closer to our goal. And so we made a commitment about five years ago that we were going to fund uh, 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 10,000 entrepreneurs over a period of 10 years. Our target was to do 1,000 every year. As at this year, we would have beat our target by, um, but in fact, we'll beat our, our, our total 10-year target because I think we would cross 10,000 entrepreneurs in, in this year because of the way we've run the program and brought in partnership. And a number of these entrepreneurs are doing amazing things across the continent. They are creating jobs. They are dealing and addressing issues and problems that you identify in the different areas and helping to provide that return, both commercially and social return that we are trying to uh, achieve as, uh, as an organization. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. Um, so Dr. Abasi, I'm going to come to you. Um, so this is for the SMEs in the audience. You know, I think one of the, one of the interesting things about impact is investing is that it gives an opportunity for people to create SDG-aligned businesses. Um, so Dr. Abasi, you are the founder and CEO of 54 Gene. Um, your company is an African genomics company that was la launched in January 2019. So can you please give us a bit of background as to what exactly your company does? And after you do that, um, I'd like the audience to know that the company recently received funding of $4.5 million in impact funding. And I'd like you to tell us what your company does and how you have been able to position your business to receive this kind of funding. And what can other people learn from your experiences? Okay, thank you. Um, so I think I want to start first by just talking about the world we live in now. Once upon a time, if you were upset with a company, you would have to send an email, uh, sorry, a letter to the company, or maybe an email, and wait for snail mail to, to, to respond. Um, but in today's world, because of interconnectedness, and that's why we're here, Social Media Week, if as a company I am doing things that you don't agree with, you could take me to Twitter, Right? And as soon as you go on Twitter, you've, get, you've gotten the attention of the CEO. And I think that that is what is beginning to make companies to say, we are not just interested in making profit, we have a responsibility. Because we don't just want to make do well, we want to do good while doing well. Now, my company is an African genomics company, and the problem we're solving is that of healthcare data, genetics data, that is leading to innovation, you know, discovery of new drugs. In today's world, almost every major new drug being discovered is being discovered as a result of human genetic evidence. Is if, as an African, your data is not used in pharmaceutical R&D, the drugs that are being discovered, efavirenz, 25% of Africans cannot metabolize that HIV drug. So if there's five of us here, at least one person will take that drug and have terrible side effects. And why is that? It's when that drug was being discovered and being trialed, uh, they did not, the, the, the drug companies did not look at Africans. The drug company did not look at Africans. And so that's what my company um, is solving. And just last year we launched and we raised $4.5 million in seed funding. Now, why were we able to do this? Um, I think it was because the investors who came into our company understand the put understood the potential for good. Now, one of the things I'd like to say is impact investing is not the same thing as charity. I think in that's fact, a very important um, thing to, to state because, sorry to interrupt, but once, I think impact investing is something that is often talked about, but people don't really understand what it is. People confuse it with CSR, they confuse it with NGOs and things of that sort. So it's a very important distinction to make. In fact, if you want to bring in charity money, uh, as an investor into my company, I probably would say no, because that means there's a misalignment in our values. As a company founder and CEO, I want to do well. I want to make money, right? I want to make to, to be profitable. So that is one of the metrics I'll judge myself by. 
but at the same time, I want to do good. I want to judge myself on other metrics. If, for instance, you know, um, how am I doing stuff that makes my work sustainable to the environment? Because of what we do, we have a biobank that can store human samples, and we have it in Nigeria, in Nigeria where you don't have electricity, right? So our option is, should we go and have, you know, lots of generators and pollute the environment, or should we go into alternative supply, power supply? And we are on 100% alternative power supply. And that's a little thing you can do um, to make a difference. For instance, we have about 80% of our staff being female, and there are only 20% being male. That is something that any company can do and you know, make a difference. You know, we have about 300 um, research jobs that we've created over the past few months across Nigeria. And for us, when we do anything we do, we ask ourselves, how is this going to also make a difference? And it's just having that at the back of your mind that you so become... So intentionality. Being intentionality. Intentional. That you become an impact company. I think if you're an impact company and an investor puts in money in your company and they believe in your mission, they have become an impact investor. So we shouldn't just push it on the investors. Companies should decide to become impact companies as well. All right. Thank you for that. Um, just to switch gears a little bit, this question is to all, so any, um, any panelist can choose to answer. So compared to mainstream businesses, social enterprises typically take longer to scale. Where they require smaller investments that drive up transaction costs and operate in a range of sectors with untested models that require substantial support beyond capital. What will it take to foster impact investing for social enterprises? Essentially, how do we create SDG-aligned SMEs? And that question is for anybody on the panel that would like to answer. OK, thank you. Um, so um, one of the reasons why I wanted to tackle that question, because it's one that we face on a, on a daily basis. Right. Um, we have a portfolio of entrepreneurs, um, about 9,000 of them now across the continent. And many of them, like I said earlier on, are trying to solve problems that are targeted at SDGs. And they face significant challenges, which we, over the years, have been able to categorize. One is, we need to train a number of these people to become um, managers of businesses, as opposed to just being people who have ideas. And in order for, in, so because when we're able to do that, these people will be able to create businesses that are sustainable in the long term, and also be able to multiply the impact that they are doing in the society. So one of it is to develop education or uh, managerial development and to, able to allow them to be able to scale in all that they do. And we try to establish that in the Tony Lule Foundation with what we do on our, our, our entrepreneurship program. The second thing is to provide access to some form of capital that is commercial. And what I mean by that is that, like he mentioned, we have to stop seeing, uh, we have to look at this uh, these SMEs, these small businesses, as businesses and help them to instill in them the discipline to be able to take capital and return capital with a return. Because when they do that, it enforces them to take certain, to conduct their businesses under certain business principles that allows some of this uh, multiplication factor on, uh, on their ability to be able to solve these uh, solutions. The third thing is to create a network. What we found at the foundation was a number of the uh, entrepreneurs in ha we have in our portfolio have solutions that address problems that other entrepreneurs in different parts of the continent are seeking to, to deal with. And so creating a network where they can all come together and be able to interact and, uh, and they can you know, share ideas and also help to deal with each other's problems we found to be very effective. And so we, we also developed a, 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 what we call TEF Connect, where we say platform where we have, you know, all the entrepreneurs, we have mentors on the platform, people, investors on the platform that come and there is this network that is buzzing that allows these entrepreneurs to flourish over time. So here are some things that I think are important to put in place to allow these things to work. Thank you for that. Does anybody else want to chip into that question? Sure. Um, I'll just share very briefly. 
Um, so from Ford Foundation's perspective, we approach impact investing in two separate ways. First of all, is through our grant making, or you could call it our program-related investing. We deploy capital with little to no expectation of returns under our program-related investing. And we do this because we want to de-risk these social enterprises so that they can receive more capital. I'll give an example. Um, if anyone has heard of the Made in Aba campaign, I don't know if anyone's familiar with it. Yes. So we essentially funded the Made in Aba campaign to set up an association of Aba shoemakers so that they could collect lines of credit. And we did this because Bank of Industry had expressed to us that they were interested in extending a line of credit, but they were worried about the possibility of collecting, yes, exactly, risk, the risk of collecting on returns. And so we decided to take on that risk, and by setting up this association through our grant making, through our funding, we were able to de-risk the investment and allow BOI to extend about 4 million Naira to these Abbas shoemakers. So let's definitely clap for that. Then on the mission-related investment side of things that we do, which um, you already talked about it, we have that $1 billion fund, which is like the largest commitment. One billion, American. not one million, guys, one billion. One billion USD <laughs> fund deployed over 10 years. That is the largest commitment by any American foundation. And through that initiative, we're de-risking our investment by working through private equity firms or fund of funders so that we can have them take on the risk and then we can go ahead and you know, deploy the capital. So that's another way that we can also ensure that this capital is reaching people who really need it the most. Thank you for that. Um, and speaking of, of reach, um, okay, go ahead. I think it's two things. What Abbas has said in terms of being intentional and having that mindset to have a theory of change that's beyond shareholder values important. And the example I use in the financial services sector is the deployment of ATMs. Now we can see the controversy over ATM deployments, especially when it comes to the central bank reducing the fees and charges they can charge. ATMs have gone down, cash in ATMs is reducing. So what the question I ask the bankers is, how many ATMs do you deploy around hospitals? And what's the purpose of the ATM to dispense cash, right? So assuming you take your relative or your loved one to a hospital and you need to dispense cash for that transaction, the ATM isn't dispensing cash. What happens? There's a secondary case of loss of life. But because they're not looking at it from that perspective, for them it's really all about how do we make money from each ATM we'll deploy in every location. That is an impact investment, but it's about changing the narrative rather than looking at it from what's in it for us, but what's in it for society and the common good in general. And I think that's the first step we need to take. How do we begin to take, change the narrative to ensure that we're not looking at only ourselves, but we're looking at everybody else? And it's in doing well, because you generate more transactions, you help more people, and then we leave a better, we leave a better legacy in general. So that's just one example that we need to be mindful about and continually think about. So when we're thinking about investments, yes, Sam, we need to have a business case. But that business case can also be flipped around that what is the converse of not doing this thing? That's a very good point. That's a very, very good point. Let's clap for that. That's, yeah. So, and, so I actually want to uh, say something uh, in response to your question. Um, I think I want to dispel the fact that it takes longer for social businesses to grow. Um, one of the fastest growing uh, startups in Africa is actually an impact type company, Andela. Right? You might say what you want about Andela, but they have provided lots of jobs for Africans, you know, um, and brought up lots of young people into a better future. Right, and when you look at um, how well they're doing, they're growing pretty fast. Um, I can also use my company as an example. You know, the fact that we were able to raise the, the highest seed funding of any healthcare startup in Africa, 
and the amount of investor attention on an international scale. Now, why is that? I think when you have an, when your company makes impact and you have a good story, you're able to attract a lot of investor interest, both impact investors and quote unquote non-impact investors. You're able to attract a lot of media attention. In my company, we've gotten media attention from the, the biggest of international companies. Yes. And we don't go looking for it, it comes to us. You're also able to attract talent. We have people leaving hundreds of billion dollar valued companies to want to work with us, right? And so when we look at that, just by being impact oriented, you're able to actually attract a lot of the factors that make you grow fast as a company. All right. Thank you for that. Um, so speaking of inclusion, thank you, uh, Professor Yinka David West, for the comments you made on inclusion. Um, Mrs. Uwais, this question is for you. In Nigeria, a lot of the investments tend to be focused in Lagos, even though most of the rest of the country has much um, worse social development indicators. How do we incentivize investments in other parts of the country, specifically some parts that are seriously lagging behind? I didn't get the last part. How do we incentivize investments in other parts of the country, specifically in some parts that are seriously lagging behind? So investments tend to be very Lagos um, focused. So how do we deploy investments, impact investments in the rest of the country? Well, I would say that um, unfortunately where poverty is highest is where we have a lack of um, infrastructure to support a lot of what is required for impact investing. So we don't have the data in many of these areas. We don't have the internet. We don't have um, reception. We don't have energy. But also, this provides a range of opportunities. I think it's the fear of the unknown. Right. A lot of people don't want to take risks. But I keep saying that when these um, impact investors actually venture into these areas, if they go in fast, they will be able to shore up a lot of profit, basically because there's practically nothing going on in many of those areas. The important thing, of course, is to convince the um, authorities, the public space, because policy also plays a, a, a very big part in terms of um, the masses of our people. The, not the elite, the elite um, people that live in, in Lagos and in Abuja mm -hmm. um, generally can do their businesses uh, without too much government interference. They can grow their businesses. But policy actually hits very hard for people who are below the uh, poverty line. Yes. Because we have um, instances, for instance, uh, I'll give the example of the minimum requirement for opening a bank account. Um, CBM regulations say you must have a phone um, or phone number. Um, many of the people that actually require virtual wallets don't live in areas, I mean this is where we haven't cracked yet, don't live in areas where we have energy, right. where we have reception, you need energy to charge the phones, and even where you have energy and you have reception, many of them, you give them the phones, they just sell them unless there's value coming through those phones. So we've been pushing, for instance, that government or CBN should uh, consider making the NIN number the minimum requirement. And because we have so many fintechs and so many bright people, um, that they can actually try and explore how we can get money to people in those remote areas. Um, they really need to get this money in a very private, very secure manner. Because um, as Yinka would know, under, in the financial inclusion space, when you pay cash, which is what we do with the cash transfers, there are a lot of people that hover around. And they know, the husbands know, that the women are getting this money. Um, the children or the, the cooks get their, their, their monies um, through maybe the phone numbers of their counselors or their husbands. They get their, they get their alerts. The women don't know. So there has to be a meeting of minds, the public sector and the impact invest investors should really approach the public officials that actually can help with policy. And that will enable us, you know, really fast track on the SDGs. I actually belong to um, a group called Catalyst 2030.
by their own calculations, this is an international thing. Uh, they say we won't attain the SDGs in the world till 2098. Mm -hmm. So we need to bring it forward. And the, there's a lot of interest on how to support various countries to attain the SDGs. We need to do so much. We need to, you know, adopt tools that are more robust in terms of measuring poverty. So the indicators align with the SDGs. We need to get the homes to uh, accept or adopt scorecards or states to uh, adopt scorecards and get everybody to work towards measuring how far and how fast they can attain the SDGs. Thank you. Thank you for that. So we have one minute for the comments and then we're going to have to go into questions. So anybody, at, can I see a hand just to see if we have some questions? Okay. So um, someone please take a mic around so we can get ready for questions. One last comment and then we'll go into questions. Please go ahead. Okay. So what I just wanted to add was um, uh, she's spoken from the perspective of the government and what the government is doing. And I think this government is doing quite a bit in, in, in trying to, to channel, you know, interest outside of the main centers. But on the side of the uh, private sector, I think one of the fundamental important things that we need to uh, recognize is that in order to make things work in our continent, we have to have people who are long-term oriented. You have to have, we can't uh, deal with the issues we have if we don't put on a long-term mindset. I think having more uh, investors businesses that see things more from a long-term perspective and not from short-term short uh, cycles, you find that those kind of investors explore beyond uh, the traditional markets that we go into. And I give a good example. We have an investor, uh, sorry, we have a, a, a company or a guy that we invested in um, who runs a school in Sokoto. This was a guy who was exposed to fundamental uh, um, um, ex extremism and was very involved in a lot of the activities that was causing security uh, troubles for us as a country. And he approached us, you know, or we've, you know, got, found him through our uh, entrepreneurship program and invested in him. And over a short period of time, he had set up a school where he was training and developing a lot of the young people who were exposed to uh, radical Islam and getting them to see the right perspective and as a result a number of those people have come out to um, become better contributors to society and he has experienced additional funding from a lot of international donors and his school has grown beyond uh, um, um, you know most schools that you have in Sokoto at the time. My point is if we don't have a long-term view that you know I may not see the short-term return of this investment that I'm making right now but I can see that there is an opportunity, even in those areas that we call uh, poverty-stricken areas, because there are fundamental needs that they have, there is an opportunity to make investments, stick with it over the long term, and then you will see returns come through. Thank you for that. So patience is definitely key uh, when it comes to impact investing. Thank you all so much for such a great panel. We're going to go into questions as we only have about five to ten minutes left. So is somebody going around with the mic? Okay, I see a few hands up. Um, let's start over here with this lady over here. Please tell us your name and kindly get straight to the question, if possible. Here, yeah, use this one. Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Lydia F. Young, and I have, a, thank you so much for your discourse and my question bothers on basically... Who's the question for? Okay, it's for um, Sam. Okay. Sam, yes, exactly. So here's the thing. My company is less than five years old and I'm the partnerships director. Now there's a problem that I always encounter when I reach out to brands for partnerships. Now basically we work with startups. Now, we are not a Ford Foundation where we can take on their risk, right? So we have to reach out to foundations like yours to partner and actually do things together that will bring about a greater increase in impact investment. Now, what are the chances that we have? Because 
basically new to, in, to the industry, I have had a lot of no's. I have more no's than yeses. I'm so sorry, Leah. Can you get to the question? Yeah, exactly. yeah, thank you. So my question is, what are the chances of partnerships that we have, like if a smaller firm and a bigger firm? Please, thank you. Look, thanks a lot for that question. So just to answer it very quickly, um, there are opportunities for partnership as far as we are concerned, and I know a number of the NGOs you have in the market. I know Ford does a number of things, and a couple of the uh, other NGOs, the major international NGOs that you have in the market. But there are opportunities to partner with you. What we have done specifically is we have created a platform. The platform is called TF Connect, and you can check it out, tfconnect.com. And on that platform, what we've done is we've brought together, you know, entrepreneurs across the continent, um, mentors who are helping to guide these entrepreneurs to do better business, which you're, you, you may fall into, financiers who are looking at opportunities on that platform and engaging with those entrepreneurs uh, directly to fund those investments, we also have on the platforms a networking opportunity where you know, all the entrepreneurs and the mentors and all that can network with one another. And on an annual basis, we try to do a forum where we bring all these parties together here in Nigeria and we are looking at other parts of the continent Sorry. where you can interact more. So there are platforms to do that. The point I'm making is that there are platforms for partnership. You can reach out to tfconnect.com and you will see that there's, there's a lot that you can do there. So tfconnect.com, just check them out and I'm sure there's something that can happen from that. Um, can we get okay a question? We have a question over here. Can we get the mic over there, please? Any of these gentlemen, it's fine. Please state your name, who the question is for, and a brief question, please. Good afternoon. My name is Gabriel. Uh, my question is directed to Madam uh, Miriam. Um, I think if we want to be realistic with ourselves. Um, looking at where we're coming from, uh, from the Millennium Development Goals into the SDGs. Uh, the countries, about 72 countries that achieved the MDGs or kind of reached a minimum or a greater target for the MDGs, if we look at how they fund their development, it was largely not donor funding, it was government funding. We want to see countries like Ethiopia, Bangladesh, or Mozambique, and some crazy countries like that, they all, yeah, I'm so sorry for saying crazy countries, but they all reached good stage. And um, looking at what Professor uh, David Ray said, it, it goes beyond a uh, business case. If we really want to achieve these uh, SDGs, we have 17 goals, 169 targets, and several other indicators. During the time of the, uh, the MDGs, I was opportune to be with the UNH then, and then I moved to the UNFPA. I know how we were able to juggle some of the interventions from the path of the UN, and this goes beyond saying that these are just UN goals. They, they are not UN goals, because they were like, people were consulted. I'm sorry, sir. These Can you get goals. to the question, please? Yeah, my question is, we need more government funding into the SDGs. It goes beyond um, uh, the impact investment and stuff like that because we'll be putting more pressure on private sectors and public sectors. We need more government funding for, for the SDGs. Thank you for that. Well, I, I, I definitely, I, I see the other way around. I think in addition to the budget, we need a lot of impact investment. We need a lot of uh, partners, network, networks, international networks, because there are a lot of things happening out there that I can actually catalyze what is happening in our country. The budget is the easiest because government can say, this is how much I'm going to give, and they don't need to see the returns on investment. They don't need to see, or the politicians prioritize what they want to prioritize. Um, there's only so much you can achieve, and I think the best way, the optimal, you know, delivery mechanism is working in partnership with the private sector, with the impact investors, so that we weed out all the waste, the corruption, we expose it. And we're able to see that, yes, we're getting delivery done to the last mile, because this is where the... There are many challenges in government, you know, even from the federal government, we cannot harness all the energy because everybody, every state is autonomous and the the, uh, the mandates for primary health care, primary education, um, agriculture, they're all at state level. So all you can do at federal level is actually incentivize the, or the, the different autonomous units to look in the same 
direction. So I agree with you, but I would say that the budget and much more, because the needs, you all know where we are with our, with our they're always saying no money, mon no money. States cannot even pay salaries. Thank you. Thank you so much for that answer. Unfortunately, that's all we have time for. So I encourage everyone to ask their questions offline. Uh, Social Media Week is a third party organization, so we have to respect the time that has been allocated to us. Uh, please allow me to thank our panelists. Let's clap for our panelists, please. Adesua Ihile, who is a special assistant uh, to the West Africa Director for Ford Foundation. Mr. Sam Nwanze, Chief Investment Officer at Ez Holdings. Mrs. Mariam Uwais, SSA to President Mohamedou Buhari on social investments. Professor Yinka David West, Academic Director at Lagos Business School. And Dr. Abasi Ene Obong, who is the CEO of 54 Gene. Um, on behalf of Business Day Media, thank you so much for being with us today. Um, and also, please take a minute. Uh, to take advantage of our two-week free trial for subscription. Um, so reach out to any business day rep that you see and we'll be happy to, you can actually scan right here uh, with your phone and please enjoy a two-week free subscription to business day and keep in touch with us. Again, my name is Lele Balde. Please kindly clap for our panelists and I hope that you enjoyed this session.